أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم بعد عوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون We begin as always in the name of Allah Allah he is the most gracious and he is the most merciful He is the beginning and he is the end and there is absolutely nothing like him. We also begin by sending peace and blessings upon his last prophet and his final messenger. The best of creation, the khayr al-khalq, the one of whom Allah has said in the Quran, نعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين We have not sent you, O Muhammad. Allah says, we have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a mercy unto all of mankind. Allah sent a messenger, he sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from among themselves, and he sent him to both Arabs and to non-Arabs, who is the most noble of them, the purest of them in nature and in upbringing, the greatest of them in intelligence and in forbearance, the most abundant in knowledge and understanding, the strongest in certainty and resolution, and the one with the greatest compassion and mercy for them. By means, Allah purified him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in both spirit and body and kept him free from all faults and blemishes and bestowed wisdom and judgment upon him. By means of him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah opened eyes that were blind, hearts that were covered, and ears that were deaf, and he made people believe in him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Arabian Peninsula, of course, is, is, a, is a land of prophets. It's a land that is rich in history. But of course, in the time of Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was also a land that was steeped in great ignorance. People had lost their way. People had lost their connection with Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they had turned towards idolatry. And one of the most, uh, amongst the, the many amazing aspects of the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that he never went that direction, right? He always kept true to belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though he didn't quite know what that meant at that time, but he never turned towards idolatry and always had a bad taste in his mouth. And of course, we know from, from our, our seerah, the many stories, of course, he would go out to the outskirts of the city and he would contemplate, he would meditate, think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, think about his purpose in the world and how he can best serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course the revelation that later followed, of course when Jibreel alayhi salam came down and taught the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he urged him to recite Iqra. When, when that happened, it was a very momentous occasion of course, and it was glorious, but it was also very difficult as well. It was very difficult for the Prophet ﷺ to understand what had happened to him and he was shaken by that, by, that, by, that, uh, by that occurrence. And of course we know the beautiful story of when he came down to his beloved wife Khadija and he told her what had happened. And she had assured him that what had happened to him was from Allah because Allah would not afflict him with anything that is not from good because of who he is. And we know these words of the Qur'an are so strong and they're so weighty and they mean so much. And there's a beautiful, well-known ayah in the Qur'an where Allah talks about how heavy these words are when He says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون Allah says, had we sent down this Qur'an had we sent down this Qur'an on a mountain, verily you would see it humble itself and cleave asunder out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such are the examples which we provide mankind so that they may reflect. 
So the challenge that the Prophet ﷺ had, amongst the many challenges of course, was that he had to convey this message. But he had to convey it to people within his own community, people that had helped raise him. And he had to convince these people that they have to change everything about themselves. They had to think about the hereafter. They had to do away with idolatry and belief in the one and believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and I think one thing we sometimes forget about, about you know, the many elements of Prophet Muhammad is that he was a human being. Of course, he was the best human being. He was a seal of the prophets. And, and, um, and, but he was still, at the end of the day, he was a human being who felt emotions and he felt sadness. And there's an example in the really early part of Revelation where the Prophet ﷺ had felt a great degree of sadness. And the reason he had felt this sadness is because Revelation had stopped for a, a, um, a short amount of time. The time varies depending on the version of the story that we hear. But the point is that Revelation did stop for a short amount of time. And it was during this time that the Prophet ﷺ felt a great deal of sadness because although it was difficult, Although it was incredibly challenging to face his community with this message, to have them change their way of life, have them challenge him and ridicule him and turn away from him, he always had this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He always had this link with Jibreel alayhi salam and with the Quran that he could always turn back to whenever he needed. So even when he was being ridiculed, he always could turn back and he can have his meeting with Jibreel alayhi salam, he could receive his revelation, and that would motivate him to continue his message. But now, since revelation had stopped for a short amount of time, it became very difficult for him, and he was very sad. In this very short surah that I'm going to just spend a few minutes reflecting upon today, which is Surah Al-Duha, one of the most beautiful surahs in the Qur'an, um, it, it, it highlights the relationship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had with his Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and how he consoled the Prophet والسلام, after he returned to send revelation to the best of creation after the short period when revelation was not being, was not being uh, received. And during this time, even though it was a short amount of time, it was very difficult because the Prophet his community, they were already very challenging. They already ridiculed him. But when revelation had stopped, they would mock him and say things like, Muhammad's Lord has forsaken him. And when we think about this, this period in time, this period in history, this link that the Prophet ﷺ had, it was absolutely everything. The Qur'an that he had this connection to, it was the solace that he had, that, that he returned to in the face of this rejection. And when revelation was cut off, so was his source of strength. Imagine being in the wilderness, being in the desert, without any sustenance or water, or without the companionship of your beloved friend. And this friend, of course, that the Prophet, the Prophet ﷺ was missing was this connection to the Qur'an. So the revelation that followed in Surah Al-Duha, it came as, as a, a river of compassion. It was mercy, it was hope, it was comfort, and it was reassurance, not only for the Prophet ﷺ, but for all of us in his ummah who recite this surah as we regularly do throughout, the, throughout our lives. It is a reminder, of course, of Allah's love and his mercy towards his beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah begins in the surah, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim bismillahi rahmani rahim wa duha wa layli ila saja ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma qala Allah begins with this beautiful imagery as is commonplace throughout the Qur'an, by the bright morning hours, Allah says. By the bright morning hours and the dark when it grows still and dark, your Lord has neither forsaken you, nor does he hate you. Your Lord has not forsaken you. Allah swears by one of the most beautiful creations, one of the most beautiful elements of creation, which is the morning light. As we know, of course, the darkest time of the night is followed soon after by the light of dawn. It's, a, it's beautiful imagery that, the, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by. There's so much symbolism in the fact that he's starting with the dawn. It's starting with a new beginning. A new beginning, a new opportunity to gain Allah's pleasure. 
And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the calmness of the night, which is the complete opposite of the morning dawn. But the calmness of the night itself has great blessings, of course, because it's a time of great reflection. We, of course, know that the Prophet ﷺ had a very close relationship with the night, is that is when he had his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would spend his nights, of course, in obedience to Allah, and he would spend his nights in worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And together, when Allah mentioned these, these, two, these two opposites, they, they paint a, a beautiful picture of the passage of time and a reminder to the Prophet ﷺ that his mission, his mission is not complete. Throughout the day, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's yet another reminder that Allah is swearing by the morning, swearing by the evening, painting this beautiful image and telling the Prophet ﷺ that his mission is to continue. And just as the one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the sun and the moon, and he created the day and the night, so too will Allah be with his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without a doubt. And Allah's message to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is so beautiful, it's as if he is consoling his beloved. The Prophet of course is Habibullah, he is the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's consoling his beloved during a time of sorrow when he needed him the most. Allah then continues, and the hereafter is better for you than the first life. Or another way can be translated also is that what will come later is better than the, is, is, is better than the former. So there, there's many ways we could, we could of course look at this. But this beautiful verse where Allah is reminding the Prophet wasallam, it's almost, in a, in a sense, it's a message that what is happening to you shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter that people are mocking you. It shouldn't matter that people are questioning the relationship you have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because your reward is still coming. He is reminding the Prophet sallallahu that the hereafter is better. What will come later is better. And another way we can look at it also is that every passing day, the Prophet sallallahu relationship with Allah grew stronger and stronger and stronger until his last day when he met Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So each day is better. So it's a reminder, once again, putting things in perspective for his, for his beloved. And it's a reminder for us as well. Because this life, this, this dunya is very, very difficult. It's difficult for a lot of us. And we don't have to look any further than just turn on the news or open up our news app on our phone to see how difficult it is. With war and famine and destruction and racism and, and bigotry and, 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 and just, that's just, that's just politics. But even the day-to-day -day life that we have to face, it can be very challenging. People can face sorrow. They can, they can, they can have people in their life that they lose. They can face depression. It's a very challenging world. But Allah is reminding the Prophet ﷺ of maintaining perspective that what is to come later, what is to come later, is even better. Allah is reminding the Prophet ﷺ of the bigger prize, of what he was working for. And it's human nature. We all want that immediate, immediate return. So it's a reminder to all of us as well to keep that perspective in mind. And we suffer for many things. As, as human beings, we, we're, we, we, we're almost programmed to suffer for many things. We can work really hard you know, to build a company, to not see any return because we we're expecting return to come later at a certain point. You know, we could, we could try to engage in a relationship to get married. It could take a long time, but you see the end goal in mind, which is, which is to get married. So you don't mind struggling for a while because you know that you will receive that reward in the end. The same goes for the dunya as well. Allah is reminding the Prophet wasallam that eternal bliss, eternal bliss is ultimately the goal. So while this was an incredibly difficult time for the Prophet ﷺ because, because of the ridicule he was facing and because of the lack of revelation during this time that helped him face this ridicule, this, he was continuing to attain a nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If everyone can please move forward inshallah to make room for people standing in the back. Allah then continues by saying, وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى 
and your Lord is surely going to give you and you will be pleased. So if you, if you think about how the ayahs are coming, first Allah is, is swearing by these beautiful things and He's reminding the Prophet of Allah وسلم, that He has not forgotten him. He has not forsaken him. He's helping provide perspective as to what this world means and what His ultimate prize is. But then He emphatically tells the Prophet وسلم, that your Lord is surely going to give you and you will be pleased. He is, he is reassuring his beloved sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he will get what he will get what will make him pleased. And when we love someone, then we, we do absolutely everything we can to make them happy. It's it's part of who we are. And if we think about it, when there's somebody that we love who is sick, we do everything we can to make them happy, to help them feel better, to provide them comfort. If they are in pain, we do whatever we can to protect them, help them feel better. So when the Prophet of Allah وسلم, was given this beautiful promise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after a brief period of time of not receiving any revelation at all, what did he do to, you know, so-called, what did he do to cash in with this amazing promise that he received? According to the tafsir of the commentary of this ayah, after receiving revelation of this verse, the Prophet ﷺ said, if that is the case, if that is the case, meaning if Allah is going to give me whatever makes me pleased, he said وسلم, then I will not be pleased as long as one single member of my ummah remains in the fire. Allah then continues in the, in the next verse, أَلَمْ يَجِدَكَ يَتِيمًا فَآوَى وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا فَهَدَى وَوَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى Allah reminds the Prophet وسلم, not only of the blessings that are to come but the blessings that he has already shown to the Prophet He says, did he not find you an orphan? and give you refuge, and find you unaware and guide you, and find you poor and, un and enrich you. Allah, of course, took care of the Prophet وسلم, as an orphan. When the Prophet وسلم, was searching for answers, when he knew that what was around him was not true, that people were turning towards idolatry, Allah sent Jibreel السلام, with the revelation. And the Prophet وسلم, was not only enriched with the love and support of his beloved wife Khadija, he of course was also enriched with the spiritual enrichment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He reminds the Prophet وسلم, of the blessings that he has bestowed upon him in the past. We should think about when we reflect upon this ayah, just the, the nature of the conversation that Allah is having with this Prophet and when we think about somebody that we love, for example, when you love your spouse, it's just uh, we, we like to enumerate the things that we have done for them. It's almost in a way reminding them of the love that they have for them. You know, for example, you know, you could be talking about something that you've done, like, well, actually, there was the other thing too. Oh, you know, you're forgetting about that other thing too. So even though the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi he already knew this. He knew about these blessings in this beautiful ode that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is giving to his, his beloved Prophet وسلم, not only is he reminding him of what is to come, but he's also reminding him about the blessings that he has given him throughout his life. Allah then continues. He ends this beautiful surah by reminding the Prophet of Allah وسلم, of his mission. He reminds, he ends the surah by reminding the Prophet وسلم, of his mission to continue to spread, to spread Allah's message and to care for the downtrodden in society, which was at the, at the heart of the mission of the Prophet Allah says, So as for the orphan, Allah says, do not oppress him. And as for those who ask, do not turn away from them, do not scold them. And as for the blessings of Allah, Proclaim them. 
Allah reminds the Prophet ﷺ of taking care of those people that society has forgotten. When the Prophet of Allah ﷺ was first commanded to spread the message, the people who were amongst the first to follow him were the people that society had rejected. The poor, women, young people, orphans, slaves, these are the people that turned towards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah is reminding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of continuing this message. And it's so fitting that in this beautiful surah which Allah is comforting, is comforting and consoling His beloved, that He ends with a reminder to Him and to all of us to take care of those people that society has forgotten. And of course, amongst the many examples of of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, perhaps the greatest example is that he was the best in terms of being the best servant to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And in the famous Hadith Qudsi that we've heard, Allah of course says that when Allah loves his servant, I am his hearing with which he hears, seeing by which he sees, hand by which he strikes, and his feet by which he walks. Were he to ask me something, I would surely give to him. This is another reminder that if we want to attain the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we have to ensure that we remember these things and that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reminded His beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Ask Allah for forgiveness. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد O oh Allah, we ask that you send peace and blessings upon your beloved صلى الله عليه وسلم O oh Allah, we ask that you allow us to spend our days in obedience and our nights in worship O oh Allah, we ask that you always protect us and guide us and never forsake us. O oh Allah, we ask that you bless us to be servants who are worthy of your blessings and your mercy. O oh Allah, we ask that you allow us to be grateful of the blessings that you have given us and be patiently faithful when we are in need. O oh Allah, we ask that you allow us to take care of the orphans and the needy and be grateful for all the favors that you have bestowed upon us. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar wa tqinna al jannata ma'a al abrar ya aziz ya ghaffar ya rabb al alameen wa sqina min hawdi nabiyika muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sharbatan haniyatan mariyatan la nazma wa ba'daha abada wa salli allahumma wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi yajma'een subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa aqim as-salah